Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. I usually have some set things I go through here at the beginning, uh, but I think today we're going to have a little anti capitalist sermon uh, before we start. Uh, I was so struck by this, I read it. Uh, it's Warren Montag's uh, response to uh, Agamben's uh, uh, article on uh, bare life and uh, what he thought of the plague, the danger from the state. Uh, Agamben's exclusive focus on a state that in his view, seeks constantly to increase its control over the population, whose freedom in turn is always freedom from the state, even under conditions of hunger and disease, is uncannily similar to the positions of the extreme right in the US. The problem is that an analysis of this type prevents us from understanding how states maneuvering to create the best conditions for capital accumulation exercise power through abandonment, withdrawal, and the laissez-mourir, letting die that accompanies the practice of laissez-faire, using their right not to kill, but to expose populations or parts of populations to the risk of death without any obligation to intervene. I like the notion of now starting off each day with the best paragraph I read on Facebook. So maybe that'll be the, uh, the sort of thing that wouldn't be on normal TV or whatever. So there it is, uh, capital and the state. Uh, we have a, a lot of good things coming up this week. Uh, on Monday at uh, 1230, uh, the EndNotes Collective will launch their uh, EndNotes 5. Um, so that will be really exciting. One of the best publications on the left that you could ever possibly read. Uh, on Tuesday at uh, noon, uh, I'll be talking to Martin Arboleda, a Chilean author who has written an incredible book called Planetary Mind, Territories of Extraction Under Late Capitalism. Uh, that's out from Verso. Uh, and on Thursday at noon, uh, we will have the out of the Woods Collective with Alyssa Battistoni uh, talking about Hope Against Hope. Uh, you'll recognize the title from an old book by Nadezhda Mandelstam. Uh, all right, uh, last before we quickly got on here, I have to mention something about money. Uh, we need it, we need it to keep going. Uh, there's nobody who will fund this particular madness. Uh, any uh, uh, any any uh, event that has as one of its uh, 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 slogans, be a communist for a month, doesn't have a lot of institutional funding available to it. So uh, without further ado, oh, I should tell you how to put the money in. So so basically you go to redmayseattle.org, which is our website, and click on donate, or you go to the YouTube description and there's a link down there to the donations. So uh, please do that. We just depend on your generosity. Uh, now I want to uh, introduce my uh, co-host to the day, who I'm really looking forward to uh, going back and forth with, uh, a filmmaker and writer, my old friend, who writes uh, for The Stranger and uh, uh, is also uh, uh, creator of the two wonderful movies, or co-creator, Police Beat and Zoo, Charles Tondere Mudede. Charles, how are you doing on this uh, late Sunday morning, Sunday brunch in Seattle here? Wow. Oh, doing great. Um, it's great. It's really interesting that you brought up um, um, Montag because um, I, uh, I I recently um, read an essay of his, which he, he used the word um, necro um, economics, and he'd borrowed it from um, 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 Mbembe, 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 uh, Mbembe, yeah, yeah, Mbembe. Um, he borrowed it from him in necro politics, and uh, and I. Uh, it was almost we sort of entered with this moment where we're sort of turning back to the economy when the pandemic is not over. Um, what is, you know, I mean, it, we sort of leapt into a new category of capitalism. And I thought that the word that he used and borrowed, um, necropolitics, fit that, fit the new situation. We've hit the necroeconomic turn, yeah. Yeah, necroeconomic turn, yes. <laughs> well, uh, Let's get started on speculative finance, speculative fiction. I'll, uh, and let me introduce our first speaker here. Uh, Cheryl Vint is a uh, professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California, Riverside, where she directs the speculative fictions and culture of science program. 
Uh, she's the author of books like Bodies of Tomorrow, Animal Alterity, Science Fiction, A Guide to the Perplex, Science Fiction, sorry, Science Fiction, A Guide to the Perplex. And she's working on a book called The Living Capital, Speculative Forces and Biopolitics, which will explore the exchanges between speculative imagination and material practice in biotech. Glad to have you here, Cheryl. Um, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thanks for inviting me and thank you to my co-panelists for being here with me on a Sunday. I'm sorry that we weren't able to do this in person as originally planned. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I've started to do on speculative finance and speculative fiction, which is actually not the work in the Living Capital book, but I'm happy to talk about that in question period if anyone wants to, to bring that up. So. Here I'm really interested in thinking through what we mean by speculative in both these terms, speculative finance and speculative fiction, and ways in which they're similar and ways in which they're different and what we can critically do with that. So I got started in this line of thinking because of the research I was doing for the Living Capital book, which was about biotechnology, and, and specifically through a book by Kashik Sundar Rajan, um, who's a medical anthropologist whose work I really admire. Um, he wrote this book several years ago called Biocapital. And in that work, he drew my attention to the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. I know it's really compelling stuff, but bear with me, it connects to speculative fiction. So this um, Reform Act um, sought to do what it called make a safe harbor for the forward-looking statements that are made by corporations when they're seeking to attract venture capital. Uh, and the logic was they needed to expand this safe harbor for these so-called forward-looking statements because there was too many frivolous lawsuits, and that's specifically their language, frivolous lawsuits, that were burdening the American economy and preventing it from being competitive um, when people invested money and then the reality didn't turn out to be what they invested in. So forward-looking statements are information that companies provide to prospective investors regarding the worth of the things that their company owns, essentially. Um, the definition in the act says that they are projection of revenues, income, and the like, plans and objective of management for future operations, uh, projections of future economic performance, and any assumptions underlying any of the above. And what the act means by safe harbor then is that it holds that so long as these forward-looking statements are identified as such at the time that they're made, and they're also accompanied by what the act calls meaningful cautionary statements identifying important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements. Um, and then finally, so long as they're made without actual knowledge that their forward-looking projections are indeed false or misleading, then no corporations can be held liable if the future turns out to be different than the one anticipated when they were seeking venture capital. So these kind of forward-looking statements that I'm interested in, these are the sort of things we find in the glossy brochures and promotional videos that are made by companies seeking uh, venture capital. And I got interested, especially in the biotech ones. And I started thinking about them as a kind of science fiction, because much like the speculative fiction that I was working on, they're always imagining these futures and projecting um, ways in which the world is going to be different. But in the venture capitalist case, it's always because of a certain kind of commodity, right? A certain thing the corporation owns. And the more I looked into this, the more it seemed like so much of our economy was indeed a speculative fiction, that all the values of these Silicon Valley stocks were based on them creating compelling fictions about the value that comes from their IP. And so all their valuation was based on a kind of persuasive narrative, indeed a kind of fiction. So I did part of my research, um, as Phil said in the introduction, on this question of commodification of um, genomics, commodification of biology, uh, and what it means that life is becoming owned in that way. But today I want to think more on the fiction part of these forward-looking statements, fiction that create value by compelling belief in the futures they promise. Um, so what does it mean then when we start to think about our economy as a fiction? Um, and of course, from one point of view, there's nothing new about suggesting that the economy is a fiction. And there's a lot of great work, which if I had more time, I would cite. And again, I'm happy to shout out to other scholars in the question period. 
um, thinking through ways in which um, the literary and modes of literary representation are entwined with the way the economy works. Here today, I wanna to focus a little bit more on how Marx uses the term fictitious capital. He uses the term fictitious capital to refer to value in the forms of credits or shares or debt, various speculative or other forms of paper money. So anything that's basically not a material commodity underlying its value. Uh, for Marx, the important thing is of course that there's no use value then underlying this speculative um, value, this speculative fictitious capital. And I think that's something that's really important for us to think about today as the economic effects of the pandemic are um, showing up in a variety of ways and we're actually realizing um, some of the ways in which the market values certain jobs and certain things and certain corporations is quite different from what truly proves to be valuable when we think of essential services and we think of what it actually means to keep our lives going from day to day. Um, so what are the consequences then of value being generated by fictitious capital in this immaterial form? And how can we bring back into visibility the various um, real and material effects that this capital has, um, fictitious or not, in terms of both those um, to whom profit flows through things like collateralized debt obligations, futures contracts, and um, the way that homes and livelihoods and perhaps even lives are lost um, for those who are devalued by this economy, who are not recognized as sources of fictitious value. And here I think that this connects really nicely with the um, Warren Montag's response to a gambin that um, introduced our session, right? Who's being um, devalued to the point of death by the sort of structures of fictitious capital. So neoliberalism and financialized capital represent an intensification of these fictions in the sense that the flows of debt repayment have now become one of the most important ways that value is generated for an elite class. Uh, neoliberalism is also based on a kind of fetish of the market, the market as an agent, the market as an actor, um, a fiction about its capacity to guide all appropriate choices, if only it's left alone from the meddling do-gooders of the state, uh, especially the state in its Keynesian variety, um, so the welfare state, which neoliberalism specifically set out to dismantle. As I begin to do research into the connections between market fictions and literary fictions, um, I discovered that some of the compelling things about the beliefs we've been trained to hold about the market and its truths are in fact not true. This should not be a huge surprise to anyone on the left. But, it, but what was interesting to me in the research that I was doing is that even people who are committed to sort of shoring up the discourse and the doctrine of neoliberalism, they're constantly having to make exceptions, they're constantly having to articulate new kinds of fictions to explain why certain kinds of state interventions in the um, that benefit capital are needed, whereas other kinds of state interventions that would benefit or um, do something for the poor are somehow like perverting the purity of the market. Uh, there's ways in which the formulas that are used to price the values of derivatives actually produce the very fictions that they're proclaiming or the truths that they're measuring by, by the fact that investors acting on belief in the um, model for pricing derivatives, thereby through their very actions, reinforce its values. So it became really interesting to me that it's not just people like me on the left who understand this is all a fiction, but indeed um, the sort of priests in the temple understand this too. They just don't want you to understand this. Uh, so the question I wanna emphasize then is what happens if we think of the speculative and speculative finance, not simply in terms of its meaning in terms of like a wager, right? That this is a gamble speculation, but instead if we think of it as similar to the speculative speculative fiction, that is extrapolating, projecting, imagining, materializing certain kinds of futures. What kind of world building does speculative finance do? And once we acknowledge that it's a kind of narrative, how then might we use the tools developed in speculative fiction to intervene in the kinds of futures it's creating? So simply put, my question is, can speculative fiction help us recognize finance as a storytelling practice? And then from that vantage point, can we tell better stories that can counter the ongoing crises of neoliberalism? So both speculative fiction and speculative finance tell stories, but in markedly different ways. 
And here I'm going to truncate what I say quite a bit because I know Steve and I are working on very similar things. And so I think he will um, elaborate a bit more about speculation and extrapolation. But in short, what I'm interested in is that they both sort of create these visions, imaginative visions of the future. But speculative fiction does throw through world building. It has to create this dense world of personalities, values, histories, choices, everything that explains why the world in speculative fiction is different from the material world of the reader. Well, speculative finance is much more interested in abstractions, right? It wants to have you focus on a specific little thing like a new um, technology and the difference it's gonna make in terms of profit or a new kind of IP and how it is that's woven in the venture capitalist statements. So it doesn't want you to think of the whole world of both whom it benefits and whom it excludes. It only wants you to think about um, the value that's generated in this fictitious capital way. So as I'm wrapping up my comments here, I wanna to turn to what might at first seem a really unlikely source, um, which is a quotation from Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom. Uh, it's probably familiar to most of my um, fellow panelists. So in this book, he says, only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That I believe is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. Now, when Friedman wrote these words, neoliberalism was on the outs, the welfare state was in, and the market fundamentalism he's seeking to promote had yet to become hegemonic. Um, we're now living in this success, um, as uh, Pyrrhic as it is, of Friedman's project. Uh, and I hope that perhaps the cre present crisis might finally convince enough people that we've allowed neoliberalism to be hegemonic long enough. And that's part of the hope then that I see in speculative fiction as another way of projecting the future one that's interested in opening up the future to radically new possibilities in the spirit of utopian science fiction, rather than the extrapolations of speculative finance, which seek to map out and then hedge against all possible futures, thereby to ensure that no matter which one materializes current power structures and the profitability of existing sites of capitalist accumulation will remain unchanged. I have hopes for speculative fiction's capacity to do this kind of work, given the relationship between the genre and the practice of utopian thinking, as is theorized in Ernst Bloch's um, important work, The Principles of Hope. So there he argues that popular culture and daily life are rife with desires and speculations about another world, dreams that are fueled by an affective sense of the inadequacy of the present, and that these dreams and speculations offer traces of a better world, what he calls the not yet conscious. This utopian impulse is what distinguishes, in my view, speculative fiction from mere futurism and also from the speculations of speculative finance. Uh, and here I wanna cite one of my colleagues, Philip Wegner, um, in his book, Shockwaves of Possibility, which is about the literary and this um, Blockian utopianism where he says that we should understand speculative narrative as a method of imagining rather than as a set of genre con conventions. He calls it, quote, a form of engaging with the world rather than a kind of content, end quote. So of course, nothing guarantees in advance that a speculative fiction narrative will counter the logic of finance capital. And indeed, some merely reiterate this logic and its ideology, or even more ominously, perhaps seek to prepare us to accept as inevitable the kinds of futures that finance capital um, is already projecting for us. Um, there is a reason after all that the techniques of speculative fiction have become favored tools of venture capitalists. And indeed the new field of innovation studies might also be understood as another branch of speculative finance from this point of view, uh, albeit one that doesn't want to admit to its fictionality. And here I'm thinking of things like Julian Bleeker's term design fiction, which is basically a marketing technique, a way of innovating that uses fiction to reveal new experiences, new social practices, and um, as he says, to reflect upon today, to contemplate 
innovative new habitable futures, end quote. Um, so from that point of view, we're inventing new futures, not so much to live in them as to market products that will bring them into being. But Bloch and the speculative fiction that follows in his model suggests something quite differently about our capacity to imagine otherwise. He differentiates between what he calls negative astonishment, which manifests merely in one's better position within an unchanged world, and what he calls positive astonishment. Uh, and another word for positive astonishment, according to him, is hope. This hope entails not only that the world might be better, but also the recognition that the good life is, quote, not attainable in an unchanged today of society or even the today itself, end quote. So he associates negative astonishment with fear and backward looking and positive astonishment and hope with the future that it implies some kind of radical break with the present. We have to change structurally, not just individually. Uh, and in his important work, um, Portfolio Society, which is about how debt has become the engine of the financialized economy, creating a new class structure of investors versus um, subprime borrowers instead of capitalists versus workers. Avon Escher argues there that, quote, even our promises are now being made to be sold or otherwise exchanged as if the mere buying and selling of financial assets were sufficient to turn an uncertain future into a source of security in the present, end quote. So in practices like venture capitalist forward-looking statements and design fiction, I would argue that speculative finance is also trying to turn our dreams and our hopes for a better future simply into commodities from which others can draw profit. So we wanna have utopian theory and we wanna have Marxist critique of political economy. These ideas, we need them to be lying around and now in a moment of crisis, perhaps we can work to ensure that they're lying around in ways that others will pick up to not only imagine, but also materialize better futures that are premised on greater equality, economic and otherwise. So speculative fiction at its best insists that we remember that the resultant world of this projected difference is made by human choice and agency. Speculative finance, and on the contrary, inculcates a logic by which the market has all the agency, the market makes the future. By critically highlighting the role of agents in its world through the world building techniques, speculative fiction then can help us respond to speculative finance's futures in ways that resist its damaging abstractions. They can help us to keep in view not simply the shiny new technologies we desire, but also the social worlds that inevitably will flow from them. I think is going to resonate throughout these discussions. The status of the future in the present. Uh, can we talk about it being already out there, colonized, foreclosed? Uh, or, and how do we square that with the notion that uh, people also uh, use describing capitalism of an eternal present, uh, uh, which has no past and future, but just the eternal repetition of trucking and bartering? Uh, these are very interesting questions. And I, I have a feeling that uh, Stephen Shaviro, our next uh, speaker, is going to talk to them. Uh, uh, Steve is the Delroy, D, DeRoy Professor of English at Wayne State University. Uh, he's the author of The Cinematic Body, Doom Patrols, Connected, or What It Means to Live in the Network, Without Criteria, Kant, Whitehead, Deleuze, and Aesthetics, and many more books. Uh, some of you know him as uh, uh, the host of a popular blog, The Pinocchio Theory. Stephen. Oh wait, Stephen. I, I do want to mention one thing. Stephen was also on the board of the uh, of the, C the Seattle C of the Cinematheque uh, in the '80s at the Grand Illusion. Uh, so it's important to. <laughs> okay. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great, especially to see both Philip and Charles, who I knew from when I used to live in Seattle, and to see Cheryl, with whom I who I consider a collaborator, and to meet Jeff and Marina for the first time, who I know only from your, your writings. Okay, well, a lot of what I'm doing is res resonate with what Cheryl was just talking about, though perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, I find it very hard usually to see the forest for the trees, as they say, I have all these very specific things and I don't have anything written out because I don't know how to make it into a kind of bigger narrative, but I'll try. 
what I'm interested in a lot, it, what I'm writing about now in science fiction is how what it means to imagine the future. And that relates to the question of how speculative finance colonizes the future. Okay, so um, one way to think about it for me is that I think it's what, it, what science fiction has often been described in a number of words I've been used, including extrapolation, speculation, and fabulation. Different people use these in different ways, but I think we can sort of systematize them and make them a valuable way to think about what science fiction is a particular kind of literary genre does, a particular form of speculation does. Speculation in particular, obviously, is entwined with um, both philosophical and economic references. So speculation has a philosophical meaning and the history of Western philosophy of the last 500 years has to do with both efforts at speculation and efforts to curb and disallow speculation because it leads to fantasy, to impossibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you want speculation to be, and discipline isn't the best word, but if you want speculation to be meaningful, it has, it's a way, it's an attempt to think about both what our basic conditions of life are and how you know, given these conditions, it's going to be made different in the future. So speculation I see as future oriented, but it also in a philosophical sense related to certain frameworks, which we are stuck within, which we can't necessarily get out of. Another way of thinking of that is again, to as Philip was just saying, to talk about or think about how the present is related to the future. And that's obviously a major issue which differs over history and over, I mean, history, so referring to the past as well as to the future, obviously. So Philip mentioned both the idea that our current society seems to turn everything to an eternal present, but also that it creates certain attitudes towards the past and the future. And obviously these are socially variable, different societies in history and different parts of the world have different notions of past and future and how they relate to the present. Um, in particular, it seems that post-enlightenment capitalism has been the society which has believed in a mythology of progress, of not only that there is a future, but the future is constant improvement. Though you can also have the future as constant degeneration, which is really just the flip side of the same thing. But in a certain sense, before the Enlightenment and before um, capitalism, we didn't have the same sense of futurity that we find ourselves having presently. And yet what that means, so in a certain sense, we're in a capitalist framework, we can't get out of that framework, but that's why we ask certain ways of what will the future bring, and especially anti-capitalist movements trying to say, how can the future be different than just a continuation and intensification of the present? sort of have to wrestle with this. But the mythology of progress has itself changed in the last several centuries. So, I mean, as we move from a kind of industrial capitalism to the kind of financial-based capitalism we have now, we have less of a sense of the future of infinite progress or infinite um, affluence or whatever. We have more a sense of future as unknowable, as catastrophic, as something which needs to be controlled and this is related to neoliberal strive to put everything into market terms. So market terms means that you can price it and you can know it. So, I mean, there are a number of ways to think about this. One is the whole question of the difference between on risk and basic uncertainty, which is something that Keynes wrote about and some other economists in the 20th century wrote about. Basically, risk is like, you know, the odds in a casino. If you put money on the roulette wheel or on a game of poker, there actually is a mathematical way of determining what your chances are. And if you play long enough and over many iterations, what happens will relate to this mathematical probability. Now, what contemporary capitalism, especially in its financial form, seems to want to do is to apply this notion of risk to everything. Everything involves risks. Nothing is certain, but we can calculate the risks and we can put a price on the risks because we can calculate them. This is what sort of the imperialism of the market spreading market valuation to everything is really about. Okay, what Keynes said, and which has been ignored by most recent bourgeois economists, is that there's a difference between that and uncertainty. Uncertainty means we really don't know. I mean, and a way to think of it mathematically, I'm not very good at math, but to the extent I understand things, if you have a closed set of possibilities, if you have 
52 cards in a deck, there are only certain combinations that can come out. You could mathematically list the probability of each of those combinations given the randomness of the shuffling of the cards. But if you do not have a closed set of possibilities, it's ridiculous. You have to list all the possibilities before you can calculate what risk is involved with each of them, what probability is involved with each one. To the extent that things are nonlinear, to think things are unknowable, to the extent that a closed set doesn't exist, or that it's impossible to calculate risk. So you might say that what um, financial capitalism with derivatives and all these other exotic financial instruments attempts to do is to deny uncertainty, turn all uncertainty into risk, to calculate it, to give it a percentage probability, and therefore to give it a give it a price. So the way finance works is that you know future derivatives always came out of futures trading. In the 1980s and 90s, my mother worked as an economist for the United States government regulating futures trading and trying to stop people who were trying to game the market and control the future in effect by, by manipulating prices and things like that. But anyway, prices are supposed to reflect the different probabilities of what will happen in the future. So if I have a futures contract, I'm going to sell you, I'm going to buy grain three months from now. The price depends not only on the current price, but also on the probability of different things happening and what if there's a crowd, what if there's flooding, what if other things happen. But supposedly you can rationally calculate and predict the probabilities of all this. And this is built into a lot of contemporary economics. It's in the efficient market hypothesis for which Eugene Fama, University of Chicago won the Nobel Prize in economics. It's built into the school, what is it? Black Skulls formula for calculating the borders of derivatives. I don't know the details of this, but I mean, everything is sort of defined as that you can know the risks of all the different possibilities and therefore calculate them and therefore price them and therefore you can price the future in terms of the present. Okay, so um, now obviously this is simply impossible because there, the future is too unpredictable. Nobody pre would have predicted COVID-19 a year ago. Um, People predicted that um, there was a possibility of a pandemic, and in fact, the U.S. government, until it was dismantled by Trump, had things in place to think about possible pandemics, but you can't really assign it a probability. It's, there's no way to do so. Um, the set of what can happen in the future is not a closed set, so you cannot calculate the different probabilities of different outcomes. Um, and that's a fundamental limit. If you understand that, then you might say that the project of finance capitalism today is not is to try to control what's ultimately uncontrollable. In other words, it's not so much that it actually reflects market efficiency or reflects all the knowledge we have, all this kind of bullshit, which mainstream economists talk about. But what it does do is it attempts to control what happens in the future. So by pricing the future, by making futures contracts, by doing all these kinds of calculations and by placing all these bets, um, the aim, the project is to make the world as much as like a casino as possible in which all possibilities are covered and priced properly, which means that the people who are in control of it can never lose money because they've accounted for all these possibilities. So if speculation, thinking of speculative fiction or science fiction is about trying to think about the future, and think about the future, then speculative finance is an attempt Precisely, not so much to predict as to control and advance the future, to face the future's possibility of being radically different and radically unexpected. Even though it's an impossible project, the attempt to control it in this way has all kinds of effects. And has effects in terms of how it creates market prices and things like that, which affect people's real lives because of how much you have to spend for various things. It's also a project in that obviously it colonizes our imaginations and gives us certain ways to think about what is possible and what is not possible. Okay, so the idea I have in general is it's a science fiction or speculative fiction attempts to imagine radically different futures, or in some cases, dystopian, dystopian things, thinks about what future we're in for, assuming we just let things go the way they are going now. Then you might say that the problem is that our imaginations are very much colonized by the way in which finance has now extended beyond just physical production of goods to involve all other kinds of transactions. All transactions now are supposed to be economic transactions. All pleasures, all desires are supposed to be priced and set to the calculus of 
the market and so on and so forth. Um, that is a way of, I mean, that, as I said, it's a fallacy literally, but it's for, as performative thing, it's a way to strain our imagination to leave us in these boxes. Now, of course, how imagination of different things relates to actually politically changing things is a whole other question, which I don't even pretend to try to answer because I just don't know. But um, if we think at least about imagination, and this is a way of to think about the future is to constrain, is constrained in a certain way. We have certain frameworks or ideologies, which even when we want to oppose our current system, which are the way in which are we think about the future. As I said, the very idea of talking about the future has a lot to do with um, the way in which um, capitalism has given us these myths of progress and so on. But in addition to that, um, it's, I mean, one way to think about this is to think about the term the late Mark Fisher introduced a decade or so ago, capitalist realism. The idea behind capitalist realism, put very simply, is that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. What that means, now obviously that could not literally be true because the end of the world is the end of everything. What I think Mark's point was that we find it easier to imagine, the only way we can imagine capitalism ending is total cataclysm, total destruction of the whole world. We find that, we find it much harder to imagine a world order which is not capitalist, which doesn't have the fundamental capitalist attributes into it. And that is a way of thinking about the, the problem that, that we face. So there's a way in which speculative finance not only actually performatively constrains our future, but, it, or, but also um, constrains our imaginations in order how we could possibly think about the future. And that's the kind of bind which I think any attempt at speculation, including especially for me speculative fiction or science fiction, has to deal with. Okay, the other side of that is, um, I think, debt. So there's been a lot of writing about financialization of the economy and how all kinds of human activities are now being financialized, including ones which under Fordist capitalism 75 years ago were not. But there's also been a lot of writing recently about debt. And some of it from people like David Graeber, who's an anarchist anthropologist, some of it from more Marxist sources. But again, we have a regime, we have regimes of debt which most people who are not experienced in their everyday lives. Um, the Marxist economist Rick Wolf um, likes to show a graph where he shows the relation between wages and productivity in the American economy. From the prosperity, which read the end of World War II in 1945 up through the 1970s, as, product, as productivity went up, wages also went up. But around the late 70s, wages completely flatlined, and that's the introduction of all things we call new realism. So um, productivity continues to increase, but wages don't increase. What that means is that things which I mean, workers could pay for, like you know, the idea about Henry Ford was that the workers would earn enough money they could buy the cars, and this would eventually make Ford richer, but would also improve the life of the workers. But now it's kind of like, you can't do that. You have to get into debt to buy what are what is sort of the basic necessities. So the flip side of financial speculation on this grandiose scale where um, big companies are trading in derivatives, which whose amount of, of monetary value is much many more times the actual physical product of the world, is that individuals are increasingly subject to schedules of debt and to basically, you can never actually get out of debt. You can only roll over your debt. You can't just to maintain on whatever is the typical living standard for your social class or for your society involves continual debt. Um, these debts are themselves packaged and resold. So you, the, your creditor doesn't necessarily want you to ever pay back the debt. They want to continue extracting money by continually having you roll over your debts. And as you pay off all debts, you incur new ones. So there's a certain sense in which debt scheduling, debt servicing become the center of, of, of everyday life for all, everybody except on one hand, the extremely rich and the one hand, people who are so desperate they don't even have debts. Um, and this becomes another way of structuring the future. The, so the Australian sociologist, um, what's her name? Um, I'm blanking on the name. Anybody? 
Lisa anyway, Atkins? Yes, Lisa Atkins, thanks. Um, writes about how, in a certain sense, this is another way of creating or structuring, organizing futurity. Rather than saying that debt leaves us with no future, which is the more generalization and more common thing, she says, what this does is actually circumscribes our future in a very disciplinary kind of a way. Everything, the future is entirely consumed by the fact that no matter what, we have to complete servicing our debts. And so on one hand, we have speculation on the part of large scale capital, which attempts to encompass all possibilities. On the other hand, we have debt scheduling, which means that we don't even have a linear sense of from the past through the present onto the future, but a sense in which all of this gets sort of scrambled up because every you know necessity of life becomes um, subject to debt scheduling and debt servicing. That's basically the purpose of your existence. Um, certainly the purpose of mine, I earn a good in, as an academic and a better income than most Americans, but I'm still, you know, this is the basic structure. You know, I, I always find it hard to imagine that people think they actually own things or have money. Because these are just these streams that come in and go out and come in and go out and you're always in debt and you're always rolling them over. And that's sort of makes it hard to retire and it makes it hard for people to get along. And it's increasingly, you know, another form of surplus extraction. So classic Marxism talks about exploitation at the point of labor, but that's increasingly being supplemented by continued extraction through all activities of circulation of consumption and so on and so forth. Everything we do has to, has to be passed through this. So I don't know, the question for me remains, how can science fiction both register that this is going on and maybe help us think differently? I'm not sure it maybe does better at the first than the second. In the past, I've written about, for instance, K.W. Jeter's cyberpunk novel from 1998 Noir, in which one of the most striking inventions in that book is that when you die, you're brought back as a zombie to pay off your debts. If you die still owning, owing Visa and the MasterCard money, then you can't even have the rest of the debt. You're brought back as a zombie and you have to constantly labor and to pay off what you can never do because the interest accrues faster than any value you actually produce from your work. But nonetheless, that's the kind of fate that people are. So I'm not sure that's giving us a utopian alternative, but it's, I think, making clear in a better sense than would otherwise be possible what the situation is. So I guess I'll leave it. There's more, but I'll leave it there and see what comes up in the discussion. Uh, thanks, Stephen. I wonder if I could ask you, you write about a science fiction story called Overvalued, which uh, really wonderfully captures the relation between speculation and debt. Could you s tell a plot of that quickly? Yeah, sure. That's a short story by Mark Stestainko, who I don't know much about him otherwise, but it's basically a slight extrapolation of the future where, you know, it costs millions of dollars to go to an Ivy League school, but you can't get a good job unless you go to an Ivy League school, you know, like Yale, Stanford, or similar elite schools. So what you have is futures contracts and people's potentialities of, of, of producing in the future. So you get a futures kind of, if you sell yourself, you get your education paid for, and the, in return, you give future earnings back to the investors. And this cycle just gets more and more intense. Then you have you know, people short selling these contracts. So you short sell a contract, and then you try to defame the person's reputation so the value will go down in the market so they can make all this money. And then, of course, if somebody's really dis you know, not performing the way to liquidate your debts is to liquidate the person who's the cause of the debts. So it sort of makes everything, it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's satire, but it's not really satire in the sense that it's not that much of an extrapolation from the way things actually operate, so. Yeah, I mean, think, I think people actually do borrow money and uh, have their returns garnished for 15 years to go to college. Uh, thank you. Our, our next, uh, before I introduce uh, Marina Vishmet, uh, the uh, general tendency is to regard uh, speculation as something that's the opposite of production, that's, uh, th that's uh, uh, withering the ability to produce and so forth. Uh, our next speaker, Marina Vishnet, has written a book uh, with the daring and audacious attempt to consider speculation itself as a mode of production. 
Uh, Marina is a London-based writer, editor, and critic, occupied mainly with questions around art, labor, and value. She teaches at the Center for Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths University of London, and she's the author of Speculation as a Mode of Production, uh, for, which you can get through Haymarket now, and uh, A for Autonomy with Kirsten Steckmeyer from Textern in 2014. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Philip. And uh, thank you, all, everyone who's uh, watching and listening to this. Um, and looking forward to your uh, questions and comments. And so excited to be on this panel with people whose work I've been following for years and years, like Stephen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really great. Thank you for asking me. Um, so some of what I'll say will echo what Cheryl and Stephen have already talked about. Um, so it, it'll be clear we're kind of at certain points converging on our, um, on our trajectories. So yeah, as Philip mentioned, speculation is a mode of production whose subtitle is Forms of Value Subjectivity in Art and Capital. Uh, was published by uh, Historical Materialism Series with Brill at the end of 2018 and with Haymarket at the end of 2019. So the inquiry as developed in that book and which will also, of course, potentially develop further from that given the book was written over a period of almost a decade. So some of it is a little bit, feel, feels a bit out of date. The inquiry acts as an unfolding of ongoing research into speculation as it can materialize in different contexts and as different strategies, focusing on an orientation towards a future and the suspension of the present to convey the most abstract capsule summary of it possible. In so doing, I was also trying to see what a negativity within speculation could look like which is to say negativity in the sense of contestation, of antagonism, so as to elaborate a political dimension to the total amorphousness and idealism that the term speculation or the speculative usually evokes in our everyday understanding, which then often gets bounded by the facts and discourses of finance, as we've been hearing. So the reason I went with speculation as a mode of production as a title is that it combines the two senses of speculation that I'm working with. The speculative practices of art on the one hand and financial speculation as an intensification of capital's intrinsic tendency for future oriented growth, both as two supposedly open-ended processes of speculation, both in their openness to the future and, all, and into affecting the future through actions or decisions in the present. So a reflexive approach to future temporality characterizes both and I explain how uh, they're also different. And I think this notion of an open-ended speculative process definitely links into Stephen's work um, as with the notion of open-ended speculation that I will mention in more detail in a moment. While speculative thought can be attributed to art, particularly in those critical reflexive practices which relate to the conditions of their own production as material and not just the ones interested in notions of utopia or science fiction thematically, for example. Speculation in its economic sense can be more broadly defined as the self-expanding or self-valorizing dynamic of capital per se, though more discernible on the ground in what Marx calls fictitious capital and what we usually call finance. My approach to crafting a systematic overview of speculation takes up a type of Marxian inquiry known as value form analysis, which would approach speculation as a social form, which shapes all kinds of patterns of social reproduction and regulatory institutions in capital, rather than just a specific subset of capital called the financial industry. Although this more specific focus is not excluded from the book's attention. So maybe this is just kind of building up why I'm calling it a mode of production, although that's also a kind of specu a speculative leap in itself. So my primary interest has been how such speculation both aligns itself with the open-ended speculation of thinking and art, uh, 
but ultimately gets enclosed on other levels of the system into generating private profit. This, this is the level of technical and ideological instruments such as derivatives, government bonds, social impact bonds, and human capital, no less than the modes of intensified exploitation and extraction that reach from the scale of the planetary to the genetic, the so to speak death drive of speculations, debt drive. And I think the discussion of overvalued, uh, which is uh, new to me, but sounds uh, incredibly generative uh, in thinking about this. Thus, speculation as a mode of production refers to the open-ended processes of art and conceptual thought, as well as the overdetermined processes of the increase of value in capitalism. The neoliberal era has witnessed the subjective qualities of creativity, flexibility, innovation, become objective factors of productivity, at least in some workplaces, and their imposed subjectivation of being an entrepreneur, while precarity of conditions is more ubiquitous across all different kinds of and classes of, of employment. At the same time as objective productivity itself shifts to the indeterminacy and risk associated with creative finance, and property speculation as the dominant mode of capital accumulation. This is reflected socially in the institutionalization of speculative processes, such as risk, in governance, education, work, or welfare. The exploitation of risk or risk-based exploitation as the cornerstone of social reproduction in this period in most neoliberally governed states and financialized economies can be evidenced through any number of empirical studies and policy documents. But my concern in the book was really to draw a parallel between contemporary capital and contemporary art as they come to constitute the poles of a society structured by speculation. An interesting discussion I've come across recently, uh, she's already been mentioned that I think feeds into the risk exploitation aspect is Lisa Atkins and Martin Koenig's essay on the split between assets so people who are assets or have assets as human capital, social capital, et cetera, the split between assets or access to assets and labor power as setting the stakes of the valorization of labor and life during this pandemic. So what has often been discussed as financialization highlights the establishment of these speculative processes as the core logic of capital accumulation. With the dominance of speculation, creativity becomes a key feature of abstract labor, which was Marx's generic category for the social institution of wage labor in a capitalist society, as profoundly non-specific and fungible, not by any means creative or singular. I suggest in the book that such a shift heralds the conversion of the fetishized creativity of art as a practice and an institution into a preeminent instance of speculation as a mode of production since art becomes no longer just a commodity in the market or a gratuitous activity, but increasingly an activity that facilitates other forms of speculative valorization, acting as a tool of socialization in the labor market, for the labor market, and the attention economy, as well as an accessory to capitalist urbanism, as in the well-known link between art venues or creative spaces more generally, also outlets of creative consumption and gentrification. It thus takes on a new instrumentality relative to the dialectic of autonomy and heteronomy assigned to modernist art by Marxist critics such as Theodore Adorno, while that dialectic itself has shifted virtually beyond recognition. At the same time, this is an instrumentality which in turn speculates with the autonomy and creative freedom assigned specifically to art in an unfree society in order to ground both its ethical claims and its financial value depending on the context. As I outline in the book, the profound structural analogy between art and money is that each of them is an instance of self-valorizing value, insofar as both are kinds of social mediation that are anchored in a reflexive circuit of valorization. Critical value in art is generated from transactions within its semantic domain, much as in speculative finance or fictitious capital, Money generates more money through transactions internal to financial markets, avoiding traversing, though not avoiding extracting profit from, the sphere of production as it is usually understood. So this homology I'm tracing between art and money 
one which reveals both art and money as marked by the nebulousness and reflexivity of value claims, is echoed in artistic and curatorial practices that the social and that work on the social and formal correspondences between works of art and money. But this discussion of a homology is intended as well to illuminate another pole of art's relation to the real abstraction of the capital relation, one which is constituted by the parallels between artistic subjectivity and a self-motivated and creative labor force increasingly encouraged to see itself as an investment, which is to say to model itself on the endless productivity of capital rather than labor, which is to say a leveraged and financialized capital, which expands by means of managed risk. And you could say that that's where the ideology of human capital is both grounded and in reality breaks down. So this is the point where I'm looking at speculation exceeding its given constraints and moving into the socially speculative register of political organizing from art worker movements to anti eviction mobilizations that involve artist activist collectives as just some examples of the open endedness of speculation sketching out a wider prospect in political and economic realities. So socially speculative here would mean taking the what I was started out calling the negativity of speculation, which emerges as materiality, as labor, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, um, nebulous omni-productivity of finance, uh, self-reflexive productivity of finance, and using them to undermine both the prescribed irresponsibility of art and the overdetermination of speculation by value in finance, and even to undermine many of the ossifications of political movements with its speculative force towards a methodology of generative refusals that try to generalize the kinds of speculations that unfold in the sphere of art, especially artistic labor, and try to think past the constraints which enable those speculations, which and the existence of a discrete sphere of art being one of the main constraints. So here I'm inspired as well by an essay I read by Max Haven this morning, where he writes, quote, to call for the abolition of the artist as an economic figure distinct from other workers still has radical potential in this moment. I don't, mean it in an, I don't mean it in a nostalgic fashion, but precisely as a way of highlighting the stalemate of capitalism's politics of work. In this sense, what will serve artists best in the months and years to come is what will serve all workers and poor people best, universal services, the destruction of the system of wage labor and the abolition of work. So I will let Max Haven have the final word and 